The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. What I want to do today is uh, finish uh, second installment of phase diagrams. Last day, we looked at unary phase diagrams, that is to say, single component. So that meant all we had to do was worry about uh, pressure versus temperature because everything's of uh, simple composition. And uh, I've got up here on the uh, uh, display uh, phase diagram of water, which we looked at last day. And I've redrawn it here for uh, convenience. And I just wanted to draw your attention to several things. We're looking at how the stability of the different phases of water varies with pressure and temperature. I've drawn the solid region over here, single phase, liquid region up here, single phase, and vapor region over here, single phase. And at some point, we transit from solid to liquid. And it doesn't happen at a single point. It happens over a range of temperatures and pressures along this line, which is called the coexistence curve. So whenever you have two phases in equilibrium, uh, they define a coexistence curve. And so here's the solid-liquid coexistence curve, liquid vapor, and solid vapor. Um, we saw what happens at our life, which is the one atmosphere isobar. This equilibrium solid-liquid, that's ice water, is at zero degrees C. And the normal boiling point, that is to say one atmosphere applied pressure, which is nominally sea level, is uh, 100 degrees C. And we saw how boiling point varies with applied pressure, and uh, that is defined along this uh, coexistence curve. Um, the other thing to note is when the three coexistence curves intersect, we have this unique, unique set of circumstances called the triple point, where all three phases coexist, and they coexist at only one point. That is to say, one temperature pressure combination which uh, is uh, very nearly identical to the uh, solidification temperature. This is not to scale, so this is slightly higher than zero degrees C. It's about one one hundredth of a degree, uh, of a degree uh, above zero at a reduced pressure of 4.58 millimeters of mercury. And at this point here, the triple point, you in fact have ice cubes floating in boiling water. There's the triple point. And then the last thing was I, I talked about supercritical fluids at the end of the last lecture. Uh, just for completeness, in the case of water, water turns into a supercritical fluid at the elevated uh, temperature of 374 degrees Celsius, 218 atmospheres. Above this pressure temperature pair, we have something that is simply fluid. It's neither a liquid nor a uh, vapor. You could argue that it's a highly condensed vapor or a highly rarefied liquid, but it, uh, it has uh, the properties of a, of a supercritical fluid. So uh, what I want to do today, what I want to do today is to now uh, look at um, multi-component systems, and we want to start with uh, two-component systems. two component systems. So we're not going to be talking about pure materials. C will equal 2. So that means now we have to think about temperature, pressure, and composition, because composition is a variable between the two components. And that gets to be messy, because we already had a pressure temperature diagram for, let's say, component A. This is component A. And over here, I've got the pressure temperature variation of component B. And here I've drawn the solid liquid coexistence curve as it normally is found in most materials, which is to say positive, because solids are generally denser than the, uh, than the liquids. Water is one of the exceptions. So now the question is, how do various properties uh, change with composition? So if I ask what's going on in between here so I can join these two. So I, I'm going to need a three-dimensional plot, pressure, temperature, composition. So I have an infinity of unary phase diagrams all across here from pure A 
all the way over to pure B with all of the different composition ratios in between. So for example, I could look at, here's the melting point. This is the melting point of A, and here's the melting point of B, and I might ask, how does the melting point vary with composition? So is that a case of, is it is a case of just connect the dots? If I know the melting points of the two end members, say copper and nickel, and I want to know what's the melting point of a 50-50 copper nickel alloy, is it just the halfway temperature between the two? Or does the temperature go through a local maximum? Or does it go through a local minimum? Or does the temperature go nuts? I mean, the question is, how does temperature of some critical feature vary with composition? So we need to look at three-dimensional stability maps. And this is a pain in the neck because it's 3D and it's, it's messy. But fortunately, this is 3091. And 3091 is, 3091 is concerned about solid state chemistry. So in 3091, we care more about liquid solid equilibrium instead of liquid vapor equilibrium. Because we don't process too many uh, materials in the vapor state. We don't use too many materials as vapors. This is the equilibrium that's most important. So when we, we know that equilibria, equilibria depend upon, depend upon temperature, pressure, and composition. And it turns out that when it comes to the liquid solid equilibrium, liquid solid equilibrium is strongly dependent There's a strong dependence between the temperature of transformation and composition, whereas the relationship between the temperature of the transformation and pressure is weakly, weakly dependent. There's a weak dependence between pressure and the temperature of the transformation. And we saw that last day. These are not to scale. In other words, these lines are nearly vertical for solid liquid. You would have to apply geological pressures to alter the melting point of water substantially. All right? Whereas we saw it doesn't take anything more than just a rise in elevation of several thousand feet to move the boiling point a lot. So that means that I can throw away the pressure dependence, throw away the pressure dependence and just focus on the two-dimensional relationship between the temperature of a transformation and the composition. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three different types of, of binary systems, and in each case we're going to assume that the pressure is one atmosphere, and we know that the, the dependence of the transformation temperatures that we write is going to be negligible in terms of the impact that pressure might have on them. So let's look at, the, we're going to look at three different types of uh, uh, systems, and they're all dependent upon the extent of solubility. And I've given them the very, um, oh, how, what's the word? Very uh, catchy, very catchy uh, distinctions of type 1, type 2, and type 3. All right, so let's look at type 1, type 1 type of binary system, okay? And type 1 binary system has complete, complete solubility. By this I mean complete solubility of the two components. Complete solubility in solid and liquid states. So that is to say, if I mix A and B, they will mix in all proportions as solids, and they'll mix in all proportions as liquids. And the second thing is, we're looking at change of state. Change of state. So this diagram applies to a change of state, and since we're talking about solid liquid, that's the only one we need to uh, document. So, and you know, let's think about what's the relevant chemistry here? I mean, I've been telling you that phase diagrams are stability maps and you can just look at them and, and consult them, but there's always some basic chemistry embedded in these diagrams. So, for example, if it were a metal system and I were to tell you that these two metals, A and B, mix in all proportions as solids and liquids, what would have to be the characteristics of those two metals? They would have to be either very nearly similar or maximally different. They have to be very nearly similar. And in fact, that's, it's the sort of a takeoff on like dissolves like, 
So complete solid solubility in a liquid state with respect to metals. When it comes to metals, there's a, a set of rules called the Hume Rothery rules. Hume Rothery was a, a British uh, metallurgist, and he enunciated a set of rules for uh, identifying candidate systems that will have this type of phase diagram. And they're very simple. Anybody in 3091 would have come up with these rules if you'd thought about it before Hume Rothery, but he beat you to it, so you can't get the glory anymore. But let's think about it. What would have to be the situation? If the two metals, A and B, are going to mix in all proportions, then they must be very similar. So they must have similar crystal structures. Crystal structures, that way you get simple substitutional solid solutions. And furthermore, if they're going to substitute solid for solid, they should have similar atomic dimensions, right? It does no good to have two FCC metals mixing where one has an atomic radius that is so large that it has to force fit into the lattice of the other. Similar atomic volumes, similar atomic volumes, and lastly, bring in some chemistry. We want them to mix and not chemically react, so they should have a small value in electronegativity difference. If they're both the same size, they're both crystal structure, but they have a high electronegativity difference, they're going to engage in electron transfer, so that's no good. But I, I think this set of hume rothery rules is nice to reflect upon in light of everything else we've learned in 3091, because the phase diagrams have, as I said earlier, they have embedded in them a lot of basic chemistry which goes back to electronic structure of the constituents. So let's draw a schematic of an AB diagram for one such system that I call type 1. So I'm plotting A versus B. This is temperature on the vertical axis. Horizontal axis is composition. So on the left side I have pure A. The right side, I have pure B. And I'm looking at solid liquid equilibrium. So at this extreme, pure A, this end member must be the melting point of pure A. And the other extreme is pure B. So this is the melting point of pure B. And I've drawn it just arbitrarily where the melting point of B happens to be higher than the melting point of A, but it doesn't matter. One has to be larger than the other. And so now this is what the phase diagram. This is going to answer the question, how does melting point vary as a function of composition? It varies like this. It's not a straight line for two reasons. The first one being that if, when you take thermodynamics uh, subsequently, if you choose to do so, you'll understand the, the, the physical chemistry behind what I'm going to tell you. Let me just state it without proof that if C is greater than 1, in other words, if you're not in a pure material, if you're in a multi-component system, if C is greater than 1, it's impossible to go from phase 1 to phase 2. You cannot go from phase 1 to phase 2 without a two-phase region in between. So we can't go from all liquid to all solid. Remember we said these mix in all proportions down here. So solids, you can mix any mix, any ratio of A and B as solids, any mix of A and B as liquids. But because we must go through a two-phase regime, this opens up to give a two-phase regime. So up here, this is all liquid. Down here, this is all solid. And in between is a two-phase regime of liquid and solid. We can call it slush. Slush. We've seen slush before. We've seen ice slush in water, the two-phase equilibrium for a pure material. This is now liquid plus solid in a uh, multi-component system. So up here we have single-phase liquid because they're mixing in all proportions. So this is a solution. Down here, these are solid solutions. And in here we have a two-phase regime, a liquid phase homogeneous, a solid phase homogeneous. And this, these lines are now no longer called the melting line or the, or the freezing line. We have two different lines, right? The upper line defines the lowest temperature for any composition. Pick any composition you want. This temperature is the lowest composition at which you have only liquid present. 
change the composition and that temperature changes but below this temperature you start to see the emergence of solids so this line here is called the liquidus 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 is is the line associated with this reaction. Single phase liquid goes to liquid plus solid. And the lower line is called solidus. The lower line is called solidus and it represents the complementary set. The solidus is the highest temperature at any composition for which you have only solid present. If you see at the line that I've drawn, the solidus temperature is the highest temperature for which we have solid solution present. If we raise the temperature anymore, we go into a two-phase regime, some liquid starts to emerge. So the solidus represents the highest temperature for all solid, and, and it represents solid goes to liquid plus solid, homogeneous solid. All right, so let's write it again. This is the lowest temperature for only liquid. And this is at any C, at any composition, any value of composition. And the solidus is the highest, is the highest temperature for only solid to be present at any composition. And this only applies once you move off of purity. So in here this is showing you how things vary as a function of composition. Um, and such a diagram that has such similarities because the end members must have common bonding, common uh, size, and so on, this type of a diagram is called isomorphous. This is an isomorphous diagram. And the shape looks like a lens, doesn't it? It looks like a lens. It's a lens-shaped diagram. Lens-shaped. Lens-shaped. But if you want to get fancy, we don't say lens shape, we say lenticular from the Latin. Lens lent, the genitive is lentis, so lenticular. It's a lenticular diagram, okay? So now we have it. Let's look at some example systems. Let's look at some example systems that exhibit this kind of behavior. Uh, oh, you know what, before we do that, I, I meant to show you this. We talked about what happens at ultra high pressures. This is water. We're down in here. See, look, this is now kilobars, thousands of atmospheres. So this is the normal line that you see. That's this line that I've shown you. That's here, okay? So there's ice at a density about 0.92, and normal uh, water is about 1. So ice floats on water. But if you keep pressing, eventually you'll force that crystal structure to change, and it'll become more close-packed. And now you see normal behavior. So liquid goes to solid. And all of these different Roman numerals represent different crystal structures. Ice has at least nine different crystal structures. Okay? And some of these are really interesting. Look at this one. This is, these are all triple points, right? This is ice three, ice one, and liquid. So in a, in a single component system, that's a triple point. That's uniquely defined. Now look at what happens over here. This is a triple point between ice six, ice seven, and liquid and it's at about 80 degrees C, way up there. Now look at this one. This is I7. I'm, right, I'm in a single phase regime. I7, it's 100 degrees C. I have to go to 25 kilobar, but, you know, we have laboratories. So it's 100 degrees C, and it's not vapor. Remember, water boils. Normal boiling point is 100 degrees C. But if I apply 25 kilobars, I not only move through the liquid, I go not only through liquid, I go right across the solid. So you saw I brought the dry ice into the classroom. By the way, I was here yesterday, there was still half of the block was still sitting there because I left it in the box and it, was, it was, had this little comfort zone of CO2 vapor around it. It was just naturally thinning in. It took a long time. What's my point? My point is when you make such a metastable state and bring it into some unnatural conditions, it will, it will last for a long, long time. The kinetics are quite slow. So let's say we go into the lab, we make ice 7. It's 100 degrees C, it's 25 kilobar, and there's a party going on down the hall. So we come out and we've got some ice 7, and it's, go it's going to start to want to, to melt, right? Because the temperature's falling, and the temperature's going to fall, so you're going to move this way and down. But some of it's going to be left. So now you go up to somebody, you take some ice 7, you drop it in the drink, 
and the drink heats up and starts to boil and the ice sinks to the bottom of the glass. That might get someone to rethink their drinking habits, you see. <laughs> but this is, this is the power of changing pressure and temperature, all right? By the way, those of you who know Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut, there's Ice Nine. It exists, all right? It's been characterized. So somebody actually measured this stuff, and we're still here. We didn't freeze the whole world, so you can relax. He, he needs to rename that, maybe Ice Eleven or something. I don't know if there are any more phases here. Okay, so here's a, here's a phase diagram, copper-nickel. That's a lenticular diagram. Copper and nickel, both FCC metals, very similar in atomic dimension, very small electronegativity difference, so you have a lens-shaped diagram. Copper melts at 1085 centigrade, nickel melts at 1455, and there's the liquidus and the solidus. And in between, if you cool at, at any one of these uh, concentrations, you're going to go through this two-phase regime. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Here's a ceramic system. Here's nickel oxide, magnesium oxide. So this is an ionic solid, right? It's nickel cations, magnesium cations, and oxide anions, and the nickel and magnesium are roughly similar in size, modest electronegativity difference, and so this one starts at 20, uh, 2,000 centigrade, goes up to 2,800 centigrade, has a lens-shaped diagram. Here's one. This is gold nickel. It's almost lenticular. Look at the top part here. There's the nickel melting point is up around 1450. Uh, gold melts at 1063. It's almost perfectly lenticular with this little bit of a dip here. It's sort of the uh, liquid solid uh, um, analogy to an azeotrope. But again, you see they're both FCC metals, both FCC metals. But in this case, the electronegativity difference is a little bit larger than you'd like. And so you see a little bit of a freezing point depression here. All right, so now I want to go back and talk about what's going on inside that uh, two-phase regime, because that two-phase regime is, is, uh, is peculiar. It's peculiar. So let's see what happens if we take something of a particular composition and cool it. So here's what I'm doing. I'm going to blow this up. I'm going to blow this up. And what I want to do is take something that's about 40%. Here's where we are. We're looking at this is the liquidus here liquidus line, and this is the solidus line. So this is all solid. This is single phase, P equals 1. This is all liquid, single phase, and this is liquid plus solid. And let's say we drop the temperature down into the middle of this two-phase regime. What's happening here, this is a two-phase system, and we we have a liquid and a solid, and the phase diagram tells us the composition. So here's the sequence. Here's, let's look at, say, composition uh, C2 there. Composition C2 is about 40% uh, nickel in copper. So at 1300 degrees C, we have liquid, homogeneous liquid. And if we go down to 1200 degrees C, at 1200 degrees C, we have a homogeneous solid. These are the different grains. So this is liquid, this is solid, and it's polycrystalline. Solid polycrystalline. And the composition of each of these grains is the same. What's happening at 1250? 1250, this diagram says I should have solid and liquid. Solid and liquid. But, look, the composition of that liquid is not 40% nickel in copper. The composition is way over here. It's about 32%. And the composition of the solid is up here at about 45%. This is 32%, uh, what am I looking at? 32% nickel. And this is 45% nickel. So I have a nickel-rich solid, and I have a copper-rich liquid. There's a, there's a, a shift. A shift. And suppose I take something of a different composition. So this is the C2 that's on the diagram. Here's C1. I think it starts at around, what does it start at? It starts at around 35% nickel. This started at 40% nickel. C1 is 35% nickel. I cool it down to the same temperature. It's the same end members. The liquid at this temperature has a unique value of nickel content. 
So it doesn't matter what the composition is, I will always end up with a liquid of one composition and a solid of the other composition. Well, how can I start with two different, this is 40% and this is 35% nickel. 40% nickel, 35% nickel. These end members are the same. There's only one variable left. It's the relative amounts of these, because I need conservation of mass, because at the end of the day, if I add up all the nickel in the liquid and all the nickel in the solid, it still has to be net 40% nickel. Only in here, it's 45% nickel. Up here, it's 32% nickel. So I've got a, a vernier scale. I've got a sliding scale that I can move so that if I have something that's 35%, in other words, it's got, it, it, it needs less of this phase, so the 35% is going to end up doing this, whereas the 40% is going to end up doing this. It's the relative amounts. This, this line that tells me what the concentration of the solid and the liquid at any temperature is called the tie line. So the tie line defines the composition end members, the liquid and the solid, in that two-phase regime. And we can take all of this that I've been talking about and we can, we can codify it. We can codify it in terms of a simple rule that captures the notion of phase separation and conservation of mass, and that's called the lever rule. The lever rule. The lever rule answers the question how much of each phase is present? The relative amount, relative amount present of each phase in the two-phase regime, in the two-phase region, two-phase region. So, for example, uh, I think on the next one I've got this set up. Yeah, here it is. So here we are with the 40% nickel. It's 40% nickel and copper. We've dropped down into the two-phase regime, draw the tie line, and the tie line tells us that the liquid, the liquid will pro proportionate as follows. So this is 40% nickel at all liquid. All right, now we drop the temperature. This is 1300. Now we drop down to 1250, and we know according to the phase diagram, we're going to end up with a liquid and a solid. And furthermore, from the tie line, the tie line tells us that the solid is going to be 45% nickel and the liquid is going to be 32% nickel. So the question is, what are the relative values? And it just, it's shown right up there on the, on the uh, transparency that the percent of the liquid is equal to the, in this case, the end member 45 minus the individual amount at the at the concentration of the bulk, minus the, uh, divided by the end members of the tie line. We'll multiply that by 100%, and that gives us a value of 38% present as liquid. And why is it called the lever rule? Because if you look at the tie line, here's where we are. We're at this value, which is shown in the phase diagram as uh, Z. This is our 40% and the amount of the liquid is X and the amount of the solid is Y. And so when I'm asking how much liquid is present, I choose the amount opposite, as you do on a, on a seesaw or a teeter-totter. In other words, to calculate what the force is here, you take the amount between the fulcrum and the opposite side divided by the total length. So this is really, this is uh, YZ over XY gives us liquid, and then the complement gives us the amount for solid. So you see that worked out for you at the, on the transparency. And this works for any two-phase regime. So whenever something drops into a two-phase regime, disproportionation has to occur, and the lever rule will give you the relative amounts. The tie line tells you the composition, and the lever rule tells you the relative amounts. Two things. I want this to be like your, you know, the and that Manchurian candidate, you know, this is your cue. If, if you, from now on, if you hear two phase, you just go lever rule. You go lever rule, lever rule. What are the end members? Tie line, tie line, lever rule, tie line, lever rule. Whenever you see two phase regime. And it'll keep you out of trouble. Keep you out of trouble. I mean, many times I get into trouble and I just think of the lever rule and I'm out of trouble. Okay, so.
Now let's look at a second case. Second case is type 2. Type 2 phase diagram. Type 2 phase diagram, in contrast to complete solubility, type 2 phase diagram is, ca is characterized by a system that has partial, partial or limited, or limited solubility. So when you try to mix A and B, they don't mix in all proportions. They only mix up to a certain point. So that's like a solubility limit or a miscibility. Miscibility or solubility synonymous. This leads to a miscibility gap, a range of composition over which you can't mix the two of them and form a homogeneous solution. And in this case, there's no change of state. No change of state. So that's either always liquid Always liquid or always solid. Always solid. So let's look at the phase diagram for one of these type of systems. A, B, I'm plotting composition across the uh, abscissa. The ordinate is temperature. And this gives us a synclinal phase diagram. A synclinal phase diagram. So above, we have single phase. So this is either, why don't I just say single phase, and this is dual phase. Dual phase, single phase, dual phase. So for example, this could be a solid, this could be all liquid, and then in here we have two liquids. Or it could be all solid, and inside here we have two solids. When it comes to solid solutions, people use Greek letters and call this alpha and beta. So this is the coexistence curve, or the solubility limit. What's the coexistence curve? The coexistence curve is liquid is in equilibrium with liquid one and liquid two. In other words, if you drop into this two-phase regime, what happens as soon as you hear two-phase? Tie line, lever rule. So the tie line will give you the concentrations at the end. Or solid goes to alpha plus beta. Both of these are solid solutions. Let's take a look at, at some of these. This is gold nickel. At low temperatures, look what happens. At low temperatures, gold nickel will actually phase separate. So if you take something like uh, this one here, which is 50 weight percent nickel, drop at high temperatures, they mix in all proportions. Drop into here, we have a slush consisting of liquid and solid. And they have different compositions given by the tie line. Drop even lower in temperature, and all of a sudden it's a single phase solid solution. FCC lattice with gold and nickel atoms 50-50. Well, in this case it's weight percent, so it's not exactly on an atomic basis. There it's about 75. And then we drop into lower temperatures, and now they phase separate. So we end up, at, for example, at 600 degrees. Let's get down to, say, room temperature. This is uh, 300 degrees C, but the lines are starting to get fairly steep. What you find is that it'll phase separate so that you'll end up with zones that are nickel rich and zones that are gold rich. And the tie line tells you the, the compositions of both of those end members. Here's one, hexane nit nitrobenzene. At high temperatures, they mix in all proportions. You drop the temperature, and then they phase separate, just as oil and water. So down at this temperature, you will have a hexane-rich phase and a nitrobenzene-rich phase. And the lower and lower you get in temperature, the greater that separation. Think about it at this constant temperature. What this is saying is that you can put a certain amount of nitrobenzene into hexane, and that's the solubility limit. If you try to put any more nitrobenzene into hexane, it won't go in. On the other side, it says you can put a small amount of hexane in nitrobenzene. If you try to put any more, it won't go in. It'll just precipitate out. And furthermore, this makes sense too, doesn't it? At this temperature, I can put, say, 0.1 units of nitrobenzene. If I raise the temperature, the solubility goes up with temperature. All of this is making sense. And finally, you get to a temperature here above which they mix in all proportions. And this temperature is called the consolute. Consolute temperature. 
above the consolute temperature, even a system that has a propensity for limited solubility will mix in all proportions. So you see this in uh, different systems. Here's, look, this one's a surprise. This is two alkali halides, sodium chloride and potassium chloride. You'd expect those to just trade off with one another, but there's a problem here. The sodium ion and the potassium ion are different enough in atomic dimension, different enough in charge density, that as you get to low temperatures, they phase separate. They phase separate. So instead of making a perfect solid solution at lower temperatures, the single phase solid solution breaks into a potassium rich solid solution and a sodium rich solid solution. Here's from the polymer world. This one is polystyrene, polybutadiene. At high temperatures, you can mix them, make a copolymer, a copolymer mix in all proportions. As you drop the temperature, they will phase separate, and you'll end up with something that is islands of a polystyrene rich phase, not pure polystyrene. There's a certain amount of polybutadiene in it. And then the other phase will be polybutadiene with a certain amount of polystyrene. They phase separate. Here's one. Certain systems, instead of exhibiting a consolute temperature in this fashion, for entropic reasons, the system is flipped upside down. So this is a lower critical temperature. This is weird because normally you think as you raise temperature, you increase solubility. This is one case where it, does, it goes the inverse. So water triethylamine mixes in all proportions at low temperature. At higher temperatures, there's the, so instead of being synclinal, this is anticlinal. It's a U-shaped curve. So single phase out here, down here they mix in all proportions. Up here, you can put a certain amount of triethylamine in and then it stops. Then you get the second phase. Now here's the weirdest one of all. This is nicotine in water. It has an upper critical uh, point and a lower critical point. So at low temperatures, you can mix nicotine and water in all proportions. And at very high temperatures, you can mix nicotine and water in all proportions. And at intermediate temperatures, they phase separate. There's the map that tells you how the system behaves as a function of temperature and composition. So in here, you can't get, the, you can't get a homogeneous solution. If you try to make a 50-50 mix of water and nicotine, and you heat that to 100 degrees C, it'll phase separate. You will not, even though you will mix it at room temperature and it'll be homogeneous, as you raise the temperature, all of a sudden you'll see milkiness, globs of one forming in the other. So what would happen if we were to take 60% sodium chloride and cool it down to, say, 400 degrees C? What happens? Bingo. Tie line, P equals 2, so the homogeneous solid solution breaks into an alpha, which is the designation for the potassium chloride rich solid solution and beta which is the designation for the sodium chloride rich solid solution and how do we figure out the relative amounts of alpha and beta? Lever rule. It's a two-phase regime lever rule. That's it. That's it. So now what I want to I'll do a little experiment here to show you how this works. So I'm going to work with a simple system. This is ouzo and water. Uh, ouzo is a drink. It's a uh, liqueur from the absinthe family. And the wormwood is the chief flavoring agent. It contains licorice, hyssop, fennel, angelica root, aniseed. So the thing is, it's got a lot of oil in it. It's very oily. It's clear and colorless, but it's very oily. And then water, of course. You know what water is. So let's have a look. Tom, can we cut to the document camera here? So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Here's water. And here's ouzo. And these are at room temperature, and I'm assuming the phase diagram looks like this. I can put a little bit of ouzo into water, and I can put a little bit of water into ouzo, but if I exceed these solubility limits in here, this is milky because it's two phase. This is milky, and this is clear. Why? Because this is single phase, and this is P equals 2. So we're going to do an experiment here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put just, this is just pure water. You know what pure water looks like. So that's pure water, distilled water. And here's some ouzo. And this is clear and colorless as well. Clear and colorless. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour uh, water into the ouzo. See, if I pour a little bit in, I can stir this and it will dissolve. 
But if I pour, so what I'm doing here is I'm pouring water into ouzo and I'm coming across. If I pour too much water in, I'm going to hit this miscibility gap and this will precipitate out. And when it precipitates out, it's got a different index, it's going to look milky. In fact, I think I've already hit there. Look at this. All right. So I've crossed the miscibility gap. Now, if, if my hunch is correct, I should be able to keep adding water and eventually emerge on this side. So let's see what happens. So we'll dilute it. So I'm going to pour this down to almost a tiny fraction. Now we'll pour in more. There. So I've crossed the miscibility gap. I can do it the other way. Let's start with uh, water. We can go across. Or we can do the other. It doesn't matter. Okay, so now, what's the, di what's the difference between this and absinthe? Absinthe is similar, but it's, uh, it's got uh, a little more color to it. Absinthe is green. And this is the same kind of a... And so when you add water to absinthe, you're supposed to add it five parts water and one part because we're going to make the louche, which is the milky. Okay, this is the way absinthe would be drunk. Uh, let's see, I'm going to pour this into here. So you can see how milky this is. Now, when Toulouse-Lautrec drank, he, called, he made a drink called the earthquake. What he did with the earthquake is he added cognac, he added cognac to the absinthe, louche. All right, so what are we going to do here? What's the chemistry? The chemistry is the following. I've got oil droplets here in water, okay? Oil, and then over here is water. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put ethyl alcohol. CH3CH2OH. And what does the OH do? The OH makes a hydrogen bond. So I've got a hydrophilic head. Got a hydrophilic head. Right? Ethyl alcohol is amphipathic. And this is a hydrophobic tail. hydrophobic tail. So the hydrophobic tail can stab the oily phase of the luge. This is what you do in cooking. You see how many recipes will ask you to add a little bit of alcohol and then subsequently ask you to, to heat it. And you say, well, wait a minute, alcohol is going to evaporate. What's going on? Whenever they're asking for alcohol, chances are you're adding something fatty to an aqueous uh, solution and it doesn't want to mix. As soon as you add the alcohol, co-solvates. Alcohol is magical for this amph amphipathic Character. So let's make the earthquake. The earthquake is with this. We're going to add a little bit of this. There. It's clear. It's it's a it's a beautiful green uh, green gold color, but it's clear because what's happened now? I've put in a third component. Now I've got water, ouzo, alcohol, and as I add alcohol, I narrow the miscibility gap. Miscibility gap narrows as a result of that. It's fantastic. Okay, t uh, Tom, may we go back to the uh, computer graphic, please? So this is where we were. We were along this tie line, and I figured the louche is here. It's uh, five parts water, one part um, uh, absinthe, and then away we go. This is, uh, this is the late uh, 1800s. Why did absinthe take over in, in France? Because there was a, a blight that wiped out the uh, vineyards. And so the price of wine shot up, and people started turning to absinthe. So you hear he's making the louche. He's pouring water through a slotted spoon on which there's a sugar cube. And here's a woman looking at him saying, wow, is he ever cool? What a guy. <laughs> hey, it's the 1800s. All right. This is an uh, object of art. This is uh, Van Gogh. This is Picasso. This is the absinthe drinker. This is uh, Picasso after he, I guess he'd had a lot of absinthe. This is... Uh, <laughs> The only thing I can recognize here is the slotted spoon with what appears to be a rather large sugar cube. And this is somebody's mind after huge quantities. The thing about it is it had thujone in it, which comes from the white cedar. And what this does is it um, antagonizes 
the receptors that regulate neuron firing. We could think much faster, but you know, we, we, we kind of slow ourselves down. So it's the gamma aminobutyric acid that, that helps us stay in place. And, and actually, epileptics suffer from a, a lack of regulation, right? But and that's a motor regulation. But in case of you know, mental acuity, so this is one of these cases where the alcohol tracks with the, with the thujone. And so instead of making you drunk and, and stupid, it makes you drunk and very, very you know, highly active. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, large quantities of it also had other neurological disorders. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you've seen Moulin Rouge, you'll see here, this is it's all about absinthe in, in that period. So what happened was, uh, th this absinthe took over. I mean, people drank huge quantities of this in place of wine. Eventually, the wine uh, was restored. The vineyards in France were restored by grafting onto American stocks. So there are very few wines in France that are not produced as hybrids on American stock. So occasionally, you'll see a bo bottle of wine that says vieille vine, old vine, meaning that that was spared from the phylloxera blight. But by and large, it's on American vines. So French wines are grown on American roots. Just remember that, OK? So, uh, the, um, so now the, the wine cooperatives wanted to get people to switch back to wine. So there was a strange alliance between the wine cooperatives and the temperance movement to get people to stop drinking absinthe. And so what happened was there were a number of uh, murder trials in which uh, somehow it was portrayed that absinthe figured prominently. And so little by little, governments uh, banned it. And uh, this is uh, uh, October 7th, 1910, where uh, absinthe is being banned in Switzerland. So here it says, uh, gentlemen, this is the hour. And this is the uh, uh, symbol of absinthe. Absinthe was known affectionately as the green fairy. That's why in, in Moulin Rouge, you'll see this sort of Tinkerbell type figure, uh, Nicole Kidman playing this Tinkerbell figure in an animation. Well, she's, she's the green fairy, and she has a wand made of opal because the beverage is opalescent. Because when, when, it, when it shimmers, you have gradients and index of refraction that give you that internal incipient surface. So here's the green fairy slain by the temperance movement, and, uh, and so on. So uh, the last thing I wanted to, to comment on is how we use the two-phase regime in purification. So much of what we know about uh, purification requires that we go into a two-phase regime, because the thing that happens in a two-phase regime is two-phase region implies compositional differentiation. Compositional differentiation. So for example, let's look at, here's the phase diagram. For one time, I'm going to go to uh, liquid vapor. So this is the f liquid vapor phase diagram of ethyl alcohol and water. So we know that water boils at 100 degrees C. This is normal boiling point. And ethyl alcohol boils at 78.5 degrees C. And you know they're both polar liquids. Ethyl alcohol is a little bit uh, more elongated than uh, water. So it's very nearly an isomorphous phase diagram. There's a tiny little uh, dip. But by and large, it's an isomorphous phase diagram. OK, so alcohol and water miscible in all proportions in the vapor, obviously. And this is the liquid. So this is the two-phase liquid plus vapor regime. So let's say you've got some wine, and it's 10% alcohol. So what do you do? You heat the wine up to this two-phase regime. And now in the two-phase regime, tie line. So what do you note? You note that the alcohol content of the vapor is much higher than the alcohol content of the liquid. So what we can do is we can condense, condense the vapor, which puts us down here. And now reheat. Condense, reheat, condense. And by doing so, we can raise the alcohol content. Or in some cases, this could be the way you purify for the liquid. It doesn't matter. I mean, you either want the condensate or you want what was uh, 
uh, the base from which you took the condensate. And, and this is used over and over again. It's used in the solid state to purify metals. Look up here on the, on the uh, slide. Suppose I have a, a solution that consists of, um, uh, over here, say 60%, 60% uh, nickel. It's all liquid. Drop it down into this two-phase regime. The solid that comes out has very much less gold in it. That means that the liquid behind is going, the last liquid to solidify is going to have more gold in it than the bulk that I started with. So I can keep taking that fraction by moving into a regime where the composition splits and I either want the, the high fraction or the low fraction. So this is the principle by which, in fact, the computer grade silicon is made. We start with beach sand, we upgrade to something that's got to be about four or five nine silicon for single crystal growth. How do we go from something that's about 98 percent silicon, two percent impurities, to such a high degree of uh, purification by dropping repeatedly into the two-phase regime and pulling out the pure fraction. So the, the key here is compositional differentiation which then allows you to distill. So you start with 10 percent, you end up 40 percent, you go from wine, you, you end up with brandy or cognac. So there it is. It's all back to chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>